Kaz Matka. I'm a science fiction writer. Um, I was asked to um, come and give a talk, and uh, they asked me what the, the subject of my talk should be. And so I, I really hadn't had anything prepared before I came to China, so I thought one of the things that I can sort of talk about extemporaneously, uh, where I can kind of go on and on about it, would be how I broke into uh, writing as a career. And I figured also that that would be something useful that I could um, give to people who are, who are interested in maybe pursuing that as a career in the future or even just as a hobby. And so my goal here is to kind of uh, try to be useful uh, and maybe just a little bit entertaining. I don't know. I don't want to predict that I will be. But um, so I've been, uh, this is my second trip to China and my second trip to uh, Chengdu. Um, so I feel like it's been a very long road for me to get to this point in my life. And if I look back on it, my path to uh, becoming a writer probably started in a really strange place. Um, if I had to peg it, I would say it started in a hospital room uh, when I was in third grade. Um, before I went to the hospital, I was kind of a, a troublemaking kid, and I was I was always I was always getting detentions, and I was definitely uh, sort of a, a wild, uh, rabble rousing sort of kid. And then in uh, third grade. I caught spinal meningitis. And I don't know if you know what spinal meningitis is, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a very dangerous disease. And so I caught it, it was a virus. And so um, my mom took me to the doctor and as soon as they realized what it was, they put me in the hospital. And I don't really have much memory for the next several days. Um, my next sort of memories that, that pop out of that time is uh, getting spinal taps. And so I would be laying in the, in the hospital bed and the doctors would come in with these um, big needles and they would take the spinal uh, fluid out of my spine. And um, I ended up, I was in the hospital for a while and while I was there, uh, you know, being a really super hyper kid, I was just trapped in this hospital bed and I, I couldn't do anything. And the TV in the hospital room that I was in just happened to be broken. So to me, this was the biggest torture in the world. You know, I was used to running around and, and, and going everywhere and riding my bike and running the neighborhood. And suddenly I was just in this hospital bed and I couldn't move, there was no TV and there was nothing to do. Um, my mom kind of took pity on me. And so she went down to the uh, hospital gift shop and she bought a book. And it just so happened it was a science fiction book. And, um, it's strange looking back how like your whole life can sort of pivot on these crazy little chances because I very much doubt I would be a science fiction writer today had that exact thing not happened. Um, so my mom, she brought the, the, uh, the book up to me and she gave it to me in, in the hospital bed and I spent the next week sort of slowly going through this book that was way too advanced for me. Um, I remember I had to ask her what a lot of the words meant you know, it was a very, you know, adult book, and I was just a third grader, so it was definitely over my head. But over the next week, I absolutely fell in love with science fiction. I fell in love with reading, and it really just changed my, changed my life completely. I remember when I finished that book, it was like I, I wanted to know where this has been all my life. You know, I realized I had wanted this, but I just didn't know it. And part of it was that you know, I was so hyper, I was such a hyper kid. And like, if someone had told me, hey, you have to sit here and read, I hated reading. I, I went from a kid who absolutely hated reading and didn't want to read, and wasn't really even a good reader, to by the end of third grade then, I was the best reader in class because after I, um, you know, after I got out of the hospital and then went back to school, um, I asked my mom, you know, please can you buy me some more science fiction books? And she did, she bought one book after another, after another, after another, and I just, burned my way through them, and um, it was probably around age 12 when I decided uh, that I wanted to try writing them, you know, like I had been reading by that point, I had been, you know, reading science fiction books, but then I wanted to actually start, you know, practicing it and see if I could do it, and so I started writing at age 12, and I had the idea that I was writing, I was writing stories, but looking back on it, I realized I wasn't really writing stories, what I was doing was coming up with premises. And I was coming up with characters, and I was kind of moving them around in these worlds I invented, but they didn't really have a beginning, a middle, or an end. Uh, they were just sort of like experiments. Um, 
but I kept writing, and uh, very slowly, you know, sort of the, the stories got better. And uh, I remember when I was 15, I got a job as a corn detasseler. Do you guys, do, do, you, do you have, do you, uh, uh, you guys know what a corn detasseler would be? Oh, probably not. It's, it's uh, someone in a field, they put you in a tractor, and you drive this tractor across the field, and your job is to just stand there in this tractor and pick the tops of the tassels off of corn and throw it over your shoulder, and you just do that all day long, hour after hour after hour. And it's interesting because that was very much like being trapped in a hospital bed where you couldn't do anything and you're just trapped there. And then I couldn't even read because I had to you know, pull the tassels off this corn. So I started telling myself stories in my head. And it's interesting because when I was eight, when I was age 15 then, I came up with the idea that would later be the very first novel I ever wrote. Um, I would come, I came home uh, at night after after uh, corn detasseling all day, and I would write write down the ideas that I had come up with during the day. And I put them in a little notebook, and you know, I came up with different lines for it. But I and I never finished the story at that point, but it stayed in my head for for years and years after that. And I had and I kept all the notes, and they would they would come in handy many years later. So. I guess that's a tip. If any of you are thinking about being writers or are chasing that, save everything. Save all your notes, because sometimes the crazy idea you came up with at age 15 will end up being your first novel 10 years later. You just you just never know. Um, so um, about age 17 was when I started trying to submit. So I would write these stories, and I finally finally started finishing them, and so I would uh, send them off to magazines. And in the United States, one of the big magazines at that time was Asimov's Science Fiction Magazine. Are you guys familiar with Isaac Asimov? Have you heard of them? Okay. So uh, there's a science fiction magazine called Isaac Asimov's Science Fiction Magazine, and there's another uh, magazine called Analog Science Fiction Magazine. And so my mother, um, she had subscriptions to both of those, so that's what I read all the time You know, when I was a kid. I would read these stories, and then I would try to write my own. So in my late teens, I started trying to submit, and I think I had this uh, idea at that time in my life that in the future, I would try to be a writer. I wasn't sure how exactly that happened. I wasn't sure how you went from just submitting stories and, and getting rejected all the time to actually doing it for a living, but I had this idea that I would at some point try to make that happen. I also had the idea I would work in the sciences. I would, uh, I, had, I had this idea I would, I would be working in STEM somewhere. And I think, you know, when I was 13, 14, 15, I might have also wanted to be a police officer. So I think I wanted to be those three things, a police officer, a writer, and a scientist. So if there was one job that could combine all those, that's what I would have liked. Um, but obviously you get older and, you know, the real world kicks in and when I went away to college, I went away as a biology major, and uh, I had the idea that I was going to uh, become a genetic counselor. So by this point, I actually had a, a plan. I was going to, I was going to uh, go to school, work in the sciences, maybe work in a lab someday, and then also, on the side, try to write. And as you know, when you're in college and you're studying a lot, it actually turns out there's not a lot of time for, for other things. So when I entered college, that was kind of like a point where I kind of slowed down my writing. Uh, there just wasn't enough time. So I just spent all my time studying biology. And everything seemed to be going very well. You know, it just occurs to me, it just occurred to me standing here that most of, uh, most of the big pivot points in my life sort of pivot around tragedies or, or, or bad things. I'm not sure what to think about that exactly. But um, anyway, when I was a junior in college, my father died. And it was a very unexpected event. Um, it sort of came out of the blue. My family was not prepared for it at all. My mom wasn't prepared. I was the oldest uh, oldest child. I had three younger sisters. And when my dad died, everything just collapsed in our house. And it just suddenly became impossible for me to go to school anymore. I just, I absolutely just couldn't go. I had to uh, drop out of college and get a job. Um, so what I did was I went to the uh, state employment office and I went to them and I said, all right, well, I have this many credits. Um, I don't have a bachelor's degree yet. Is there any job I can get with just these, just this amount of credits? And uh, the, the, the uh, counselor you know, went through the computer and, 
came back a couple minutes later and she said, yeah, you, we have a job opening in a steel mill. I said, all right, I'll take it. You know, I'll, any, I'll take any job. And that was the same job my dad had. My dad worked in a steel mill. My grandfather worked in a steel mill. And now here I was, you know, entering the steel mill. And I was, I was very happy for that job because that was going to sort of keep things afloat. And uh, when I hired in at the steel mill, uh, the job they gave me, I was a laborer in the center plant. And if you know anything about steel mills, you know the center plant is pretty much the worst place in the mill you could work. It's sort of like an above ground coal mine. And there's all this black dust and it's raining down on you all the time. And the floors just get coated with dust and the tables get coated with dust. And it's just this constant snowfall of black grime. And that's why they need laborers. They need guys with shovels to come along and shovel the dust off of things, otherwise it would just plug up the whole building. So that was my job. I would uh, throw up my uh, steel mill flame retardant work greens and my uh, and my helmet and my steel toe boots and I would take the shovel and I would, I would shovel all this dust or I would shovel, you know, when the dust was cleaned up, then I would shovel coke on the conveyor belts that fed into the blast furnace. And um, once again, that was sort of like, um, that was very similar to sort of being trapped in a hospital bed or, or trapped in a, uh, in, a, in a tractor corn tassel. You know, you're just sort of doing this monotonous thing all day long. And so once again, I sort of retreated into my little fantasy world where I would be shoveling the coke on the conveyor belt and I'd be inventing these stories. And so what I started doing was on my breaks, I would take these, these little sample sheets and I would sort of flip them over and I'd write little ideas on the back and then I'd take them home with me. Then whenever I got home at night, I would kind of like expand upon them and then they turned into stories. And then so I started submitting again. Uh, so I started submitting to Asimov's uh, Science Fiction Magazine. I decided that's the magazine I want to get into. I want to get into Isaac Asimov's Science Fiction Magazine. And so I just submitted over and over and over and I got rejected over and over and over. And at some point I read a biography by Stephen King, and he talked about um, how he broke in as a writer, and what he had done as a kid, where he had uh, started submitting stories, and when he would get the rejections, he would take the rejections, and he would put the, put the rejection on a nail that was sticking out of his bedroom wall, and he put the rejection on the, on the wall, and it was just the stack on the wall got bigger and bigger and bigger, and at some point, he finally sold the story. And you know, it was a success. So I decided, all right, that's that's good advice there. I'm gonna copy that. So but I didn't have a spike on my wall, but what I had was this little drawer and it was by the nightstand of my bed. So I decided, all right, I'm gonna collect all my rejections in this nightstand and before this drawer fills up, you know, I will I will sell my first story. So that was my strategy. So years go by. And during the course of uh, of these years going by, I um, I also uh, went back to school to finish up my bachelor's degree, but I, I only had time to take one class a semester. And so I had to take the last 12 credit hours. I just took it you know, one at a time. It ended, ended up taking me four more years to finish up my bachelor's degree. And at this time I was doing, doing all this writing while I was still working in the steel mill. And uh, once I finished my degree though, um, I finally had my bachelor's and I ended up uh, applying to work in the chem lab at the same steel mill that I worked at. You know, they had an opening in the lab, so I ended up getting hired to work in the same lab. And I slowly sort of worked my way up the ladder, you know, during this time period. And I eventually uh, ended up working um, uh, in a research lab. And uh, so that's, why I, that's what I was doing while, while I was submitting sort of near the end of this time period. Um, so once again, the, I was submitting the, the stories constantly and I was getting rejected and I put them in the drawer. And then one day I got a rejection, it must have been like my hundredth one. And so I go to put it inside the drawer and then I went to try to shut the drawer and I realized the drawer, the drawer wouldn't close. And I thought, well, this, this isn't good. So I'm like trying to sh you know, shove it in the drawer, trying to get the drawer to close. And it's just so filled with rejections that the darn thing won't close. And it's like I had this epiphany. I realized Stephen King didn't need two spikes you know, he had one spike, and by the time he, you know, filled up that spike, he had broken in. But, you know, I couldn't, I didn't have a second drawer, and it hit me, wow, I guess I'm not going to ever be a writer. Like, if it was going to happen, it would have already happened. Like, 
I must not have what it takes to be a writer. Um, like it just must not, whatever that magic thing is, I just must not have it. And I just totally sort of collapsed and got depressed and I decided I was gonna give up. I was like, why am I wasting my time? You know, spending all this time and energy trying to tell these stories, no one's ever gonna read them, they're never gonna be published. You know, I should be doing something else with my time. I should be doing something productive, like, you know, I don't know, any, like painting or something, anything other than this. And so I did, I gave up, I totally gave up. I decided, that's it, I'm not gonna be a writer. And then a little bit of time passed and I realized that no matter what I did, I couldn't stop. So even though I had decided to give up, no matter what, I would still get the ideas for stories. And then even though I tried to resist writing them down, I couldn't, so I would end up just other, okay, I'm just gonna write the ideas down. And then I would think, well, I wrote the idea down, I might as well just see how it develops. And then I would, well, I saw so how it develops. This would be a cool ending. Next thing you know, I've, I've written a story, even though I didn't want to. And then once I had the story written, I thought, well, I might as well send it off and collect a rejection for it. You know, it's done. Might as well, I might as well get a rejection. And so I sent it off. And I realized, and at, at this point, sometimes it would take six months or eight months or nine months to even get a rejection back. So once you sent it off, you know, I would just forget about it. But I sent it off, and then I ended up writing another one. And I sent that off. And, you know, I ended up writing another one and sent that off. And I realized that me, having totally given up on writing, looked identical to me striving as hard as I could to be a writer. Like, from the outside looking in, I was behaving exactly the same. I was writing all the time and submitting all the time. The only difference was in my head. The difference was, in my head, I had totally given up hope. Um, and I will say an interesting thing happened here. So I think there's, I think there's something that happens, or at least it, it happened to me. I think my writing actually changed at the point where I gave up hope. Because whenever I was really, really trying to be a writer and I was really striving to, uh, to make that happen, I was actually studying the editors and I was studying the magazines and I would think, well, this editor, they like a ma they like a story that's, that's that works this way. So I'm going to try to write that kind of story, or I'm going to try to write the kind of story I think that this editor would like. And I was so I was trying to change my style to match what I thought certain editors would like or what certain readers would like, and so um, that was how I wrote the story. But once I had given up hope and I realized, all right, I'm never going to be a writer. It's never going to happen. I no longer worried about that. I no longer thought about. Uh, the editors. I no longer thought about what anyone else would like, and I just sort of wrote them for me. And in doing that, the style of the stories actually changed, which I think was uh, important considering what happened after that. It turns out that the very first story that I had written after I'd given up hope and sent off in the mail and then had forgotten about, that very first story was the first story I ever sold. And I remember the, uh, the letter came in the mail, and by this point, I'd see, I received so many of them, I just, I knew what it was gonna say. And uh, Asimov's Magazine at this time had this interesting pattern I, I had noticed where the rejection letters would always start off saying something nice about the story, and then it would say, well, we can't, we can't buy it, you know, or, oh, but, but alas, we, you know, it's not for us at this time. And so I opened, I opened the letter, and the very first line of the, of the letter, instead of saying something good about the story, and then, saying something bad about it, saying they're, they're, they're gonna reject it. It started off saying something bad about the story, and I thought, geez, I'm, I'm definitely going to reverse here. It's like the first line was sort of negative, and then the second line was, kind of broke my brain, because the second line seemed to say that they were accepting the story. And I actually stopped, and I reread the line again. And it still seemed to say they were accepting the story, but I assumed that this couldn't be correct. There's no way, I mean, they weren't gonna accept the story from me. So I, I actually doubted my own reading comprehension. And so I read the, read the line a third time, and it wasn't until reading the line a third time where it began to dawn on me that this was actually an acceptance letter. And when it finally did dawn on me that it was an acceptance letter, I remember I got so excited that I jumped into the air. I didn't intend to, but I drew jumped into the air, and I remember looking up and seeing the ceiling come closer to my eyes. I, re I remember that distinctly, thinking, I've never seen the ceiling from quite this high before. 
And then, you know, I, I, I landed and I was screaming. I, like, I, it, was, it was one of the greatest moments ever. It's like I had been working for so many years just to get this, just to get to this one point, you know, where I was, you know, finally getting accepted to Solaris. So of course, the first thing I did was I called my mom up and I told her, and then she wanted me to, to come over. So I brought, I came over and I brought the acceptance letter to her, you know, and she was all happy. Then I called my sisters and told them, and uh, it just, it was just great. And then um, shortly after that, probably uh, three or four weeks after that, I get another uh, letter in the mail from the same magazine. And it's another acceptance. The other, another story that I had already sent off and had sort of forgotten about was also accepted. And then it just sort of snowballed from there. So I sold, I sold the first story, then the second, then the third, then the fourth. And then suddenly, it seemed like everything I was writing, I was able to, I was able to uh, get accepted somewhere. So I, I sent to uh, Isaac Osbaum Science Fiction Magazine, uh, Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. Um, you know, I, I sent to a bunch of different places, and I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to start seeing my, my stories getting published. And uh, so I just, I, I wrote as fast as I could and as much as I could. And within a year after that, I started getting um, my first uh, acceptance in, acceptances into a Year's Best Anthology. And I don't know if you know what a Year's Best Anthology is, but it's a, where an editor, a book editor, will read as much short fiction as published in the magazines as he can in a given year, and then he will pick his favorites and reprint them and put them in a book. And I had never been in a book at this time. And so I was told that one of my stories was selected to be reprinted in this book of year's best science fiction. So that was another big thing that I, that was almost bigger than I had even dreamed of, of ever happening. And uh, so that, so then it was published. And then the next year, I had two stories that were accepted into a Year's Best Anthology. And the year after that, I had four stories that were accepted in Year's Best Anthologies. And so my short fiction was starting to get uh, attention. Um, I was also nominated at one point for uh, a Nebula Award for uh, Best Novelette. Um, and shortly after that is when I heard from the video game industry. So. I had gone to a science fiction convention and um, I was talking to some of the other writers and some of the other, pe other people in the industry about the exciting direction that I thought uh, storytelling was going. And this was, this was after, after Halo had come out. And I remember just being so impressed by the game Halo and, and just thinking that the future of storytelling is gonna go in a bunch of directions that really no one, no one has considered. And I thought that video games are just, they're gonna explode in the future and just be this great avenue for, for telling stories. And I remember talking about that with a bunch of writers and some editors. And it, w it must've been a month or two after that where I got an email where apparently um, my comments about you know being interested in video games and being interested in video game uh, telling had apparently gotten around to someone who worked at Valve. And so I was invited out to come visit Valve talk about video games and so that became sort of my entry into the video game world so I ended up uh, flying out to Seattle and I spent time out there and then one thing led to another and the next thing you know I have I have a, an invite to come work at Valve and at first it seemed like a very like I, I wasn't sure if I would it almost seemed like a, like it couldn't be real you know it's like I was working at, at this point I was working in a, in a research lab and I thought, how am I going to leave my research lab job to go work in the video game industry? Like, is that something real people do? Like, can I do that? And then I remember I, I talked to my talked to my mom about it, and by this point I was married, and uh, I talked to my wife about it, and they both said, well, how can you not do it? I thought, that's a great answer. How can I not do it? So that's exactly what I ended up doing. So I moved out to moved out to Seattle, and uh, I worked at Valve, and there were some great games that were released during that time period. Um, whenever I was out there, uh, Portal 2 came out, uh, Dota 2 came out. Um, I got to work on the Portal 2 comic. Um, that's something that, that was a lot of fun, you know, doing storytelling in comic form. And um, I think as it says in one of my bios, I was one of the, one of the main writers on Dota 2. There, there were several other writers that also worked on it. Um, one thing I'll say about working in the video game industry is very collaborative. 
And that's one of the things I like about it so much because uh, when you're a writer and you're, you're telling short stories, you're writing novels, um, and in some ways it's kind of lonely because it's just you and the computer and you know, you're typing away and next thing you know, four or five hours have passed and you're just sitting there by yourself. Uh, but in the video game world, it's not like that at all. There's, it's, it's usually a bunch of people sort of all talking together and coming up with ideas and pitching ideas to each other back and forth. And then the, theoretically, you know, the best ideas kind of win out. And, you know, it's a lot of fun. Um, and so that was my experience uh, working with Valve. You know, it's a, it was a great experience. It was a lot of fun. Some great games were, were made while I was there. Um, whenever I was working on Dota 2, um, you know, I was there for most of the recording, sh recording sessions. And, you know, that was also a lot of fun. Um, getting to meet all the voice actors that went into the game. Uh, I was also shocked, you know, once once the game was released, at how fast the public got way better at the game than I was. And I thought, wait a second, I've been I've been playing this game in build for like several months. They've only been playing it for like a week. How am I already worse than them? So that's when I realized, like, there are people out there that are just naturally like being able to work on video games and write video games is not the same as being super good at playing them. So that was that was. So after working at Valve for seven years, um, I ended up working at Bungie for a couple of years. A couple of years, and I worked worked on some games there, and that was also a lot of fun. And during this time period, when all this was happening, I actually also uh, started uh, writing and or finishing and selling my novel. So my first novel was published while I was at Valve, and that's a in English. The title is The Games. Although I was told the Chinese translation, the title is. Gene competition? Does anybody, anybody know? <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, and um, so, and that was the story that kind of harkened back to my uh, working in the working in the cornfield days. It was that same. It was that same original premise um, that I'd come with, come up with all those years later. And so that was published while, while I was at Valve, and then I published another book called uh, Prophet of Bones, and then I, I started I started working on my third book then. Uh, my first book was about genetics and genetic engineering, which is what I had always wanted to do. And so I thought, like, life had sort of come in this weird full circle. You know, even though, you know, I wanted to be a geneticist or a genetic engineer, and I, you know, I wasn't able to, but I thought, well, I can't actually be a genetic engineer, but I sure can write about it, right? So that's what I did. So it was a way for me to kind of, like, um, explore that area, you know, you know, the path that I wasn't able to take. And so writing that book, writing that book was a lot of fun. And then my third book was uh, about quantum mechanics. And I look at that as my, it's, it's my, my lab tech book. So I remember I, I saw a reviewer was talking about my books and they, they say there's a genre called space opera. Um, and that just means it's a, cer a certain style of, of story. But they, they said they realized that my books were lab opera. And once I read that review, I thought, oh my god, they are lab opera, aren't they? So they're all, it's all these, it's lab tech and trouble. And so that's what I write because that's kind of what I was living. You know, that's, that was, I had all that experience working in laboratories and working in a research lab. And when I worked in a research lab, I ran an electron microscope. And so I just wrote about that in, in my third book. The main character was the guy who ran an electron microscope. And I just sort of slide it all in there. So that would be another piece of advice. If I had, had to give an aspiring writer uh, advice, it would be do a bunch of crazy jobs because you never know what, uh, what's gonna come in handy later. And you know, I haven't mentioned this, but during the course of my life, I've definitely had a bunch of crazy jobs. So in addition to working in the farm fields and you know, working in the video game industry and working in the research lab, I've also uh, painted houses. I did that when I was in college. I painted houses, I was a dishwasher, um, I was a zookeeper for, for a little while. That was that was a, a fun job to have. I got to and I and that was another um, job that I ended up writing story a story about. And I wrote a zookeeper story that got published in Osmots magazine and it actually won uh, an award for you know best science fiction. It was a fan award that was chosen as their favorite story of the year. Um, and uh, so. Yeah, doing a lot of different jobs sort of, sort of gives you a richness of experience that you can draw from. And um, 
I actually feel like had I not worked all these, all these crazy jobs over the years, I don't know what I would write about then because the jobs that sort of uh, cemented me and, and given me you know, a foundation from which to write uh, a character experience because, uh, and I've heard this said elsewhere, you don't really know who your character is until you know how they make money, until you know how they feed themselves, until you know how they put a roof over their head. And that's sort of something you'll see in, in sitcoms sometimes or in television where you won't, like that won't be there. You'll think, I never see this character on TV actually go to work. How do they pay their rent? You know, I never, they're always doing all these things, but no, wh where are they getting their money from? And so you, in a way you don't really know them. So. Um, that's something I always tried to do, though. You know, I always tried to base my my characters around an occupation of some sort because that's sort of how I always understood myself. You know, once I sort of knew who I was whenever I was whenever I was writing. I mean, uh, whenever I was I was working on something. And so the final step of all that is actually to then just write for a living. And that's sort of where I'm at now, uh, where I'm able to just um, you know. I go down in my basement and I write during the day. I still actually work in the video game industry as well, part time. Um, I work for for another video game company, and it's sort of a nice uh, life balance for me right now, where I still have one foot in video games and one book, one foot in the publishing world, and hopefully I'll have more stories published here. Um, I just finished up a fourth novel, um, and it's right now in submission at some publishers and some agents. So. My goal is to, to see it published, but we'll see. So fingers crossed on that. Um, let's see, were there were there any questions that anybody anybody had? So uh, had you guys heard of me uh, because of Dota, or was it because of <laughs> <laughs> fiction, or was it? <laughs> Actually, I have a question. Sure. That's uh, about how to. About how to transform uh, an idea in my head into a story, because uh, uh, often there's an idea in my head and I I create a file in my computer and I and uh, I wrote it, I write a title and uh, ten minutes later ten minutes later I delete that file. I don't know. I don't know how to write a story. It's like the, I, I always think uh, for example, uh, say what, what if say um, uh, there's. What if there's a what if there, 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 what if there's a black black star on the black star on the moon, and uh, but there's like the like, uh things like that in like an idea in my head. But people don't need the idea; they they need the story. But I don't know how to expand that idea into a story. That is a great question, and um, and I've actually been asked that by my own daughter. So I I, I have a daughter, and she's she's writing too, and. Um, so I think there's a difference between a premise and a story. And looking back, I realized that most of the ideas that I thought were actual stories whenever I was first starting out were actually just premises. And they were cool premises, and you have to have a cool premise to sort of uh, you know build a story around. But until you do that second step, yeah, it's, it's not really a story yet. It's just a cool idea or a cool premise. And what I found is you don't have your story until you know who your characters are. And to this day, I still have cool premises in my head that I can't write yet because I don't know who the characters are. I don't, I don't know what the conflict, the crisis, and the resolution will be. So you can have, like, like for example, uh, my first, my first book. The elevator pitch for that was, what if, what if, um, like a, a gladiatorial event became a competition for genetic engineers? What if, what if different countries were genetically engineering competitors to fight? That was the premise, but that was definitely not a story. It wasn't until I knew that main character, Silas, and it wasn't until I knew who he was, knew what he wanted, knew, was it, knew what he was risking, and what his goals were. It wasn't until I knew that about that character that it actually turned into a story. Um, so I guess my advice would be, if you're already having these cool premises and pop in your head, just start, that's the first half. Start thinking about characters. And, and what's been useful to me is to not, not try to do them at the same time. So sometimes I'll get a, a, a scientific premise idea and I'll write it down. Sometimes, when I'm not even thinking about a scientific premise, I'll just come across like, man, this would be a cool character. 
this will be a cool character moment, or I'll meet somebody that I, I think that if they're, they're interesting, I'll think, oh, this person would be a cool character. And so I'll write down like kind of a cool character idea, you know, and that's a different file. And then so you have a file that's full of cool ideas, premises, and then you have a file that's full of cool characters, put the two together. And then if you know you have a winner, whenever the character conflict that you have in some way circles back or resonates with the uh, problem that, uh, that is like the original seed problem for, for the premise. And so in the case of, again, my book, it's just easier to talk about my own stuff since it's in my head. Um, so Silas Williams is the main character of the book, and he had a lot of personal issues about never knowing his father. And I, I had come up with this character in my head. I knew, I had this whole arc I knew, but whenever I came up with him, I didn't know he was gonna go in that book. It wasn't until later when I thought, wait a second, here's a character that's really motivated by, and, and his personality is shaped by never knowing who his father was, and now he's a genetic engineer who's creating these living things for whom he technically is the kind of the father, right? They wouldn't exist without him. They may not have his DNA, but he's bringing them into the world as a scientist. And I thought, what a cool sort of resonate, resonating idea, you know? So, so putting this particular character in this particular story allows me to explore that character in a way that if I just made him, you know, if, if he wasn't in a story about that, I might never really be able to fully explore that idea. And so, um, so your idea is, I heard you mention the moon, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you would have to ask like, what is the cool sort of arc of the premise you see happening in sort of the plot or the direction you think you want to go in that and then start asking yourself, all right, what, what kind of cool characters that you would have thought of at a different time, most likely, which ones would fit best in that? Um, another thing I can say about that is sometimes, all right, this is, this is my third book. So in my third book, The Flicker Men, that, that's, a, that's a book that centers around quantum mechanics. And I knew that anybody reading the book would have to understand quantum mechanics in order to get the plot. Because the whole plot centers around this very weird quirk in quantum mechanics, uh, something called the Copenhagen Interpretation. And in order for them to understand what's even going on, they're gonna have to know about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is very difficult and there's a wide range of how much people know about it. Like the idea would be that somebody who is a PhD in quantum mechanics could read my book and not be bored by it. Well, at the same time, somebody who knew nothing about quantum mechanics should be able to read the book and follow it. So the challenge became, how the heck do I pull this off? Uh, how do I talk, of, how do I put enough quantum mechanics in here so that the person understands it, but then also doesn't bounce off it, right? Because as soon as you see like, you know, a page full of formulas, who's gonna read that? That's like, that's, that's like a math book. You're not gonna wanna do that. So because of that problem, I knew that I had to, I had to do something else to carry the tension in the book because I knew I was going to have to sneak in 30 pages of quantum mechanics near the beginning third of the book and no one's gonna read that unless there's something really dangerous going on or if there's something at risk or there's some big problem for the character. No one's gonna, no one's gonna read about just a perfectly happy character that's thinking about physics all the time. That would, be, that would be incredibly boring. So I knew I had to give my character a lot of personal problems that would carry the tension. And so because of that, that's how I chose which character to put in that, in that book because I had already thought of a character that had a lot of personal problems and that was struggling with uh, alcoholism and um, you know was trying to was, was trying to you know get through this problem with uh, unemployment I knew I had a character in my head that I had, that I had sort of designed I just didn't know it was for that book and so once I you know put those two things together that's whenever I had a story so it was premise sort of matching up with the character um, are there any, any other questions about that <coughs> any other uh, aspiring writers? Could you give some advice on how university students keep writing? How, how they can keep writing keep, while they're in... How else keep writing? Oh, that's a tough one because, yeah, that was sort of the low point for me of, of writing was when I was in the university. Um, yeah, I wrote a lot in high school, a lot in middle school, and then once I had a, you know, a job shoveling coke onto a conveyor belt, I wrote a lot then too, but actually in college was sort of a low point for me. So um, 
you know, I guess, I guess my advice on that would be focus on your grades first. You know, that's the most important thing. Pass those classes, and any time that you have to, uh, to spare, work on writing. The important thing is save those ideas, save those starts, save the premises that you have, save the character ideas that you have, and just because all that time is going to go by, and you have to capture it. Right? And you might not have the time right now to write that story. Right? It just might not be possible because you're studying for calculus or whatever. But the thing you can save is your idea. So save that idea, write it in a file, S save it in a place that's not going to get lost, um, and then also save the character ideas and, just, and also realize that those are two separate things. Your premise for your story is different than your characters. And so if you just, if you meet somebody that's kind of cool or you, or you invent somebody, some character in your head that's kind of cool, Realize that that's very important and don't think well. I don't really have a story to go with them and ignore it No, write that down too. That is just as important and just save that and you never know when you're going to use it Like like I already said uh, I mean actually like I have a I'm still writing stories from Little bits of scrap paper that I wrote down when I was 22 years old So I mean to this day I'm still doing it. So I have this giant stockpile of all that stuff I actually I have more ideas than I actually have life to write if I live to be 70, I'll never be able to finish them all. And some of the best ones were when I was when I was young and in college. You know, just saved it on a scrap piece of paper. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm, can I ask you what you what's your opinion about the Cyberpunk 2077? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? Uh, could you repeat that? It's, Cyberpunk, 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 I don't have an opinion on that. I'm not familiar with what that is. It might have a different name. I, well, I'm not sure. It's what about it's okay. CD Projekt, the video game. Yeah. Cyberpunk 2077. Yeah. You know, some, <laughs> some, somehow that, that blew right past me. I don't, I don't know. I might. I, I did just finish a novel, so I've sort of been buried head down in the computer for the last year. So it could be something that just, uh, just, uh, I just didn't notice as I was focusing on other things. Uh, what, what's your opinion on it? I'm interested in that. Mm, I think it, it will be a good Cyberpunk game, but I can't play it right now because it will be released in the next year. Yeah, well, don't 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 play so many video games that affects your grades. Just realize that. <laughs> <laughs> grades are the most important thing right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I actually I, do so. Yeah, even even my son, I I have a uh, I have an eleven year old at home, and I have to like limit him. I'm like, okay, only an hour a day on on video games. Or sometimes I make him, uh, I actually make him pass like a little math test before I'll let him play, and he'll get so mad. He'll get so mad too. So I'll fill out those little math tests and all right, you get all these right, you can play. And then whenever he doesn't get it right, I'll, I'll give him another problem and another and another. Next thing you know, he spent like 40 minutes on math and he's like, I could have been playing video games all the time. I have one more question, maybe not so not, not so related. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned your career for you mentioned your work for the Valve for seven years. Yes. Right. Um, so have you so have you participated in the in the story of Half Life 2. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I, I, I know. I know all the people who have, but no, that's uh, that's not something I ever got to work on. Uh, so, do you have uh, during your work during your work there? Um, do you have any information about uh, Half Life 2? <laughs> <laughs> if if I did, they, I'd have to be killed. No, <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm a fan too. I would I would love if I do something, but I I don't know. Yeah, that'd be really sad. Yeah. <laughs> you know I won't let you go this easy, right? Right, now I'm nervous. I have two questions for you. Okay. Uh oh, you brought me here, so okay. Uh, the, the first one is that uh what's your opinion about hard science fiction? Yeah, you know, that's a hot topic right now. There's a lot of uh, Discussion about hard science fiction versus uh, soft science fiction, and you know I'm very biased. I do not, I do not pretend to be unbiased on this. I, I'm in love with hard science fiction. I love, I love hard sci-fi. The harder, the better. To me, I love. 
it's an art form uh, to get hard science into fiction, and I think it's an important art form, and it's that's what makes it different than other forms of literature. And you know, there are, there are a bunch of different kinds of literature out there, and the thing that makes science fiction special is you know being able to you know slide the science in, and you actually can. I think it instills a attitude in the reader that science can improve things and science sort of like moves us along a, as a culture and as a species and, and, and as a society. And, you know, I, I've always preferred hard sci-fi. It's definitely like harder to write or at least for most people. Uh, and so I, I try to put as much science in my stories as I can because of that. And I would like, my goal would be to actually invent some new science and put it in a story where it turns out 100 years later you were right. I mean, that's like every science fiction writer's fantasy, right? It's like, it turns out you actually predicted something that would actually come true later. So I don't know that that will ever happen, but that's my goal. <laughs> so, well, the second question is that uh, I was learned uh, that uh, with uh, the characters you are writing after a certain uh, period, they will grow their own souls that you uh, as a writer, you just can't control what they would say, what they will do. Uh, have you ever met into such occasions, and uh, how would you uh, deal with such circumstances? Okay, I, I, I lost you halfway through the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean that the, the characters you are writing, you are uh, writing, uh, they will uh, prove their own souls, and you as a writer, you can't control what he will do, what he will say in such a story. Have you ever um, made such occasions? So are you are you asking me if I feel like the characters in the story mm -hmm. um, sort of have their own their own out of your control? Uh, out of my control. Yeah. You know, yes, I, actually, yes, and and not because I feel like they're you know they're they're real entities that have their their own sort of agency or anything like that, but it just turns out that you can't, once you design a character and center a character around a certain set of characteristics, if you try to write them in a direction that feels false, it just, the story falls apart and it doesn't work, and so it fails. And so you try to get them to do something that, that wouldn't match their, their design, their original design, and it all collapses. So it turns out you just can't do that. So you're, you're sort of, you're forced to write them in such a way um, that they remain sort of true to themselves over time. Um, and it also helps too if you like sort of base characters off of like composites of people you know. And then you can kind of ask yourself, well, would, would so and so do that? Probably not. So then if you try to write them in such a way that it would do a certain thing, it just doesn't work. So, yeah. yeah so I don't know if that answered the question exactly, but it's a little bit. <laughs> That's kind of solved my question. Okay. Well, Question that is about a, a mom, uh, and uh, that kid is mine. And uh, now he is, uh, he has enough words to read something like the fiction novels. And uh, uh, you have talked about, uh, talk, talk a lot about your experience in your childhood. Yes. Your mom gave you a lot of choices to to read some fictions yes. or some uh, other kinds of fictions. And uh, do you have some idea to suggest us? to uh, how to help the kids to uh, encourage them reading and writing in their, uh, for the pupils, I mean, the pupils from the primary school? That, that's a great question. I've actually struggled with that myself. Um, <laughs> and because I look at how much I loved reading as a kid, I mean, and it, it just, it's a terrible idea to give all kids spinal meningitis to try to make that happen. That it's not worth it. Um, and like my own son, uh, he's more interested in video games than he is in, in writing. And part of me like dies inside and like, no, you're supposed to like fiction. But so I guess the, the short answer to that is, gosh, if you find an answer to that, please tell me, because I, I don't know. Um, I try to, I will say my son uh, tends to like comics a lot. And so I'm kind of using that as um, sort of like a, an in try to get him interested in, in actual you know science fiction books or in actual books. But then on the other hand, you know, as a writer, it kind of bugs me that they're not, it's not like paragraphs, it's not like prose. And I want him to 
you know, be able to read prose and to enjoy it. Um, whereas, you know, comics are, you know, it's a different animal. But I thought, you know, at least it's a start. It gives them turning those pages. Um, maybe the answer is you just have to run across that one thing that just really lights your fire and gets you super excited. And I just happened to have found that in, in third grade. And, you know, maybe no, my son hasn't quite yet. Um, maybe, maybe just exposing them to as much stuff as possible will increase the chances that they come across that. And that, so that might, that might help, that might be an answer. Sorry, I don't have something more specific. <laughs> it's a good question though. Because it's, it's, it's a question I've thought about and I just haven't come up with my own answer yet. Uh, yeah. I have another question. Sure. That is about uh, your readers. Most of them are adults, right? Yes. Yes. Some uh, from middle school. But will you have some plan to write some the fictions to the pupils of the primary school or something like a lower grade? Yes, yes. I, I <coughs> actually wrote a book uh, with my sister. So my sister is also an aspiring writer. And so she and I wrote a YA, so a young young adult or, or kid, kid novel together. And uh, I actually have it submitted at Science Fiction World. I just haven't heard, heard back, but it's a, a story about dragons and about, uh, it's a coming of age story about um, a girl who gets her driver's license. And so it's sort of centered around that and there are dragons in it. And uh, so yes, that would be definitely appropriate for kids. And that was a lot of fun to write too. Um, and the reason, the original idea for the story was mine, but I thought, what do I know about girl, you know, 16 year old girls getting their driver's license and I thought my sister knows about that so we'll sort of bring her in on the project and so she and I worked on it uh, off and on sort of in our spare time for about a year and until we finally finished it up so I, I, I really I really like it I hope I hope someone's interested in it although I will say when I gave it to my agent um, you know the, you know having written a bunch of hard sci-fi I think it's, it was a little confusing it's like wait what what are, what are you right now are you YA about a girl getting her driver's license and uh, dragons? Okay. Maybe in, in future, hopefully, your, uh, your novels could come to the pupils' classroom. That would be right. Yeah, really that great. would be nice. I would like that. Uh, I want to ask uh, uh, Will you write a uh, book? Uh, have you ever felt that your characters uh, are around you? Uh, uh, I mean that uh, uh, the characters are in the uh, uh, just like uh, in the real life, real, real life, uh, or just the, the just your, your just your book, uh, your book story, uh, 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 just uh, just real life, uh, just real life in, in somewhere in the world. You know, I think writing whatever is going well. It almost feels like you're in a dream state and because you lose track of time and you know you put your head down you look at the keyboard you look at the screen and then you're just lost in this dream of the story and then the next time you look at the clock you know three or four hours have passed and you think gosh I haven't moved for three or four hours how, how where did the time go and you have all these pages and you've written and so I think there is something you know strange and interesting about that um, I wouldn't say that I thought I felt like the my characters were like um, out there in the real world anywhere or but but the idea that they they do exist in this sort of alternate world of the dream state that's definitely different from the real world and also different from whatever you manage to capture on your computer and so in a way that's what writing is you're trying to steal these things that you're inventing in your head from this from this dream state in your head that you're in, you try to kind of pull them out of there and, and imperfectly transcribe them onto the page. And you never quite pull it off. All the characters are more real in my head than I ever managed to get on paper. And you know, sometimes I'll read it later and I'll think, oh gosh, that, that's, that's so close to what this character's really like. But then I have to ask, well, what do I mean by what they're really like? Because what they're really like is what's on the page. Well, that's sort of proof that they do live in a different way in my head than, than the page will be like. Another question. Uh, I want to, I used to write some, some story and in the deep story, the, the conflict between the characters is uh, uh, too little so that the story is boring. So how to solve this um, uh, 
the program to change the character or change the environment or something else? Probably uh, most, it'll almost always be change the environment. Um, unless, unless you have the same problem I had where you have to, you, you're having to get the reader to sort of, uh, you have to trick the reader into learning a bunch of science, and then in which case you probably better change the character to carry the tension. But usually the right answer will be, there's a saying we use as writers uh, in the West, we'll say, uh, put your character up in a tree and then throw rocks at them. So don't stop at just a tree. So if you feel like there's not enough conflict, well, that's putting the character in the tree. That's not quite enough conflict. You start throwing rocks at them, you know, really give them problems, you know, really, and the bigger the problem, the more interesting the story is. Um, yeah, the engine of a story is always going to be conflict, and it, and the, you know, almost you almost always be conflict in the plot, and it'll more rarely be conflict within within the soul of the character, and that, that's definitely much harder to write, and you only need to do it in certain circumstances. We we have a friend. We have a friend in our chat, you know, chat group. Okay. Not, not here. Okay. Not present here. He and he he has uh, he has three questions. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I can express him correctly. So okay. I try that. Uh, he wanted to ask the firstly, firstly, uh, in the in the fiction world, uh, not only sci-fi, when facing when when facing with something completely unknown to humankind. Uh, a normal, p a normal people, a normal person should, uh, so how, how could, how, how should a normal person act, act to be completely unknown to them? I think he's, uh, I think he's referring to the things like a Sulu or like, uh, or like the aliens or other things. To, uh, should he, should he, uh, should he be desperate and uh, run away, or should he be? Or should he go? Or should he uh, try to know? Try to know it. Try to understand it. I, you know, I think it depends on the character and the how the character responds to that will sort of reveal a lot about the character. On the other hand, that's the that's the first part of it. The second hand is that it has to be realistic to the reader. And so, if you have the character act in a way that's very unbelievable, then the reader's going to read it and say, well, nobody would actually do that, and you kind of fall out of the book. So those are the two uh, sides of the pendulum there. Uh, I will say, I, as a kid, would have been a terrible character in a book, because I never would have reacted how a normal person would have reacted. And I wanted to see aliens. I was ready to see aliens. I was ready to see monsters. I was, I just knew this stuff was possible, and if it ever happened, I would have reacted completely, completely unexpectedly to it. So had I been a character in a book, people would have read my character's responses to that stuff and said, well, the writer has lost his mind. Nobody would ever actually act like that. But in my case, it would have been true. Uh, his second question is that, is your, what's your attitude about the relationship between the humans and the knowledge? Like, uh, more, more knowledge, less, uh, uh, like, more knowledge leads to the self-destruction or more, or more knowledge leads to the leads to a uh, better a better future and people should sacrifice everything for for the knowledge. Man, that is a deep philosophical <laughs> question. I really like that question. Gosh, uh, you know, my gut instinct is to always pursue more knowledge. But with this caveat I realized, man, that that has, carries a lot of dangers at the same time and then, you know, when I look out uh, up into that sky at night and I see all those twinkling stars, you know, it does occur to me there's nobody talking back to us, right? There's, the, have you guys heard of the Fermi paradox? The idea that uh, it's silence out there, like where, if there, if aliens are possible, where are they? You know, yeah. there's there's some filter out there that's stopping, that seems to be stopping intelligent life from sort of existing in a way where they can where they can contact us. So it's it's like this big silence out there. Maybe the pursuit of knowledge is part of that. I mean that's sort of like a horrible thing to think, but but I but I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. And maybe there are dangers to too much knowledge. And I say that though, but every fiber of my being chases after more knowledge. Like I want it, I crave it, and I would never sort of want to put a stop to it. But I guess I'm nervous about it 
at the same time. That is the final. The last question is that how to uh, uh, how to make people how to make a reader feel that you are writing a real story to to be more realistic. Sure. The, the first thing you have to do is you have to sort of believe in it yourself. Like you have to write it in a way that feels authentic to you. And there is sort of this um, this sort of judgment that comes into play as a writer, where you you, you know you write something and you think, well, is this going to seem realistic? Is this going to seem believable? Um, uh, is the dialogue going to seem false? That I mean, dialogue is its own art form. I mean, there are some people who can write pages and pages of dialogue, and it feels like. It feels like you're sitting in a McDonald's or something and you're just listening to real people talking. And then there are other people that write dialogue and you read it and you think, no one ever talks like that in real life. Give me a break. <laughs> so, you know, it's the aesthetic choices that the writer makes, I think, which kind of decide uh, how realistic something something seems. And all you can do is use your ear and use your own judgment. And, you know, probably a lot of time, you know, you could be wrong. I mean, I, I could have been wrong in, in different choices I made with certain of my books where there could be parts of it that, you know, a reader would say, oh man, okay, you, you lost me there. No one would actually say that. Um, or you just never know. Anybody else uh, any out there with a question? Is anybody else out there an aspiring writer? I'm just kind of curious. Uh, how many of you out there are sort of writing stories or starting stories. Anybody want to raise hands? Okay, well, okay. well, you're not raising your hand, but you talked about it already. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm so nervous. Oh, don't be nervous. No, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous too. See, I, I, I write because I'm terrible at talking. Like writing, when I write, I sound smart, but when I talk, I don't know. So this is uh, nervous for me too. I have deleted, I have deleted 10 of files. Oh, don't well, don't delete them. Whatever you do, save them. Save them because they might come in handy thirty years from now or twenty years from now. Just save everything and then and then pick through them. And one thing I'll say about stuff you save, it's funny because um, you won't necessarily know what's good when you when you come up with it, right? You put it in a folder or you put it in a spiral notebook and you think, oh, this is a good idea. Well, here's another idea. This one's kind of dumb. And you come back ten years later and you look at it, you might realize the one you thought was dumb. That's the gem. That's the good one. And the one you thought was great, oh, that's terrible. That's like that's like cliche. <coughs> so save everything. Do you have any failure to just like refused by some uh, by some publishers? Do I Your writing is refused by some publishers. Uh, I, maybe yeah. the writing always, you know, at the beginning is uh, really hard to be accepted by. Yeah. By others, right? Yes. Do you have any of these kind of feelings and give us some advice? You know, you have to have pathological tenacity. You have to be able to accept rejection. Um, I look at the, the publishing world and the, the fiction world and the video game, basically all these sort of creative jobs. You, it's so hard to break in. And you just have to accept that being rejected is a big part of it. And I think if you know if William Shakespeare was alive today and, and writing books, I mean, he'd, he'd face a lot of rejection at first. But I have to think that eventually, as long as you stick with it, and as long as you keep writing, and as long as you keep submitting, you know, good things are bound to happen. You just, you just, I don't want to say you can't give up because even I gave up, right? I guess just write. You know, if you do feel that you you can you can stop writing, or you do feel you want to get up, give up. Well, you know, if you can still write your stories while having given up, maybe that sort of can give you a sort of freedom. But whatever it takes to just keep writing and keep turning out the stuff, and most importantly of all, keep submitting. Because if you just write a great story and stick it in a drawer, and no one's ever going to see it. But if you write a story and you put it out there in the mail and you collect your rejection for it, you know, do that enough times. You know, there's a good chance the rejection will turn into an acceptance. And once you have one acceptance, it does seem like the others come easier. And I don't know if the editors sort of put you in a different category in their minds because you know, whenever you submit a story, you can say in the in your in your letter, you can say, "Well, I've already been published," you know, in in this magazine. Then the editor looks at it maybe more closely, or if maybe just the confidence of having been published helps change your 
you're writing in a way so that the editor is more likely to buy it. I don't know which one is uh, more likely to be true, but um, it is true that one success leads to another. Any other questions? You know, China is a, a big market for the writing. You know, now uh, the the government, uh, uh, a lot of the families will encourage the kids to read more and more, including some scientific fiction works. And uh, when you think about maybe now you will focus on our uh, on our market, maybe in the future. Uh, all the kids will know you. That is uh, that is the very important for you. I, I would I would love that. Um, as a writer, it's like um, I want my stuff to be read by as many people as possible. That's sort of always the goal. And you know, one thing I like about being a writer is that the work can sort of stand for itself. And so you yourself as a person don't necessarily have to be front and center. It's the work. And you know, I like being in the background. I like like a lot of attention not necessarily being on me, but I like my stories to get attention. And I like them to be read by a large number of people. And China is, you know, by population, the largest country in the world and has a lot of a lot of eyeballs and a lot of, you know, people who are who are reading. And so yeah, that's a that's a super exciting thing. Um, I will say, you know, Science Fiction World magazine, that is the single magazine in the whole world that published the most of my stuff. Um, I you know Whenever I write something, I will send it to a bunch of different magazines uh, in the West in English. But whenever it's you know I want it to be translated, I send it to Science Fiction World, and so that's the magazine. All my other stuff is divided amongst a bunch of different magazines. But in China, it's only one. It's Science Fiction World, and so they've published more of my work. So if someone only reads Science Fiction magazine, they will read have read way more of my work than if they only read Asimov's. So. I, I thought that was an that was an interesting thing that just sort of popped in my head a couple of years ago. Like, like who is my main audience? I wonder. I almost wonder if my main audience kind of isn't the readership of science fiction world. Any, any other questions out there? Okay. Well, I guess if there's no more questions. We can just wrap it up then. If that's Anybody else has anything to add? Maybe uh, if there's no question, maybe there's something. I want to ask. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure, sure. Okay. Have you s uh, think of write a story about Chengdu or Panda? <laughs> <laughs> I, I hadn't thought about uh, the Panda, but now you put the idea in my head, so I don't know. But uh, but Chengdu, yeah. I you know my last experience here was was. It's fascinating, you know. It's a fascinating place, and I did go and visit. Um, I don't remember the name of the building, but it's the largest building by volume in the world. Do you know what the name of it is? It's here in Chengdu. Global Center. Oh yeah, yeah, the Global Center. Yeah. So I, before I came to Chengdu, I actually Googled Chengdu and like, oh, what's what's interesting to see there? And I had read that the largest building in the world is the Global Center. I thought, oh my God, I have to see this. And um, so me and a couple of other writers, we actually took some taxis and we went and saw the Global Center and it just blew me away. It was, it was the size of like a, like, a, like its own, like a space station. That's what it felt like. I thought, oh my gosh, like look at, look at the size of this thing. And then I remember I went through the doors and I saw this escalator that seemed to like go up to heaven. It was like the longest escalator I'd ever seen. And it really did, it really was very inspiring. And uh, one, the novel that I had just started before that was a, was a novel about a giant building, about a giant tower. And so being able to like visit a giant mega tower, or not tower, but giant mega building in real life, I was like, well, this, this is interesting. I can maybe, wonder if I could, you know, be inspired by some of the things that I'm seeing around me. So it's quite possible that some of the elements of, of that ended up in some of my work already, which just hasn't been published yet. You know, it's, it's the book I just, just got done with. But yeah, have you have you ever been to the Global Center?
else? Any, any last minute questions? Statements? Declarations? Anything? Thank you for thank you for coming out, and I hope I didn't bore you guys too much. Uh, uh, do, do you know the famous writer in Chinese, Mr. Uh, Neil? Uh, his book is the famous the three body problem. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know the the wandering earth is uh, very famous and it become the uh, movie. Yeah, I've seen the movie. I've yeah, seen it's it. the movie. Uh, um, do you know what's the difference between your book and uh, the? The well, three body problem, and uh, I'm just uh, Mr. Neil. So I haven't I haven't read uh, the three body problem yet, but I'm going to correct that the second I get home. I've already decided. Everybody everybody's talking about this book. I, I have to read it. So uh, if I if I come back to Chengdu, I'll have an answer to that. But I have watched The Wandering Earth. That's on uh, that's on Netflix at home. Um, I watched that about about three months ago. And yeah, it was it was a great it was a great movie. It was uh, very well done. Um, so, at least as far as Wandering Earth goes, you know that's a that's set in space and you know far future and very fantastical, and lots of action and adventure. So that's different than my novels, but it's it's uh, similar to some of my short stories. So my novels so far have been sort of near future, set on Earth. Uh, science thrillers um, they're sort of centered around just you know different aspects of science but it's all set very much here on earth but some of my science fiction short stories are set in outer space and there's all kinds of and I don't know why I don't know why my brain makes novels that are set on earth and short stories that are set in space it seems like I should be able to switch that sometimes if I want to but so far it hasn't happened yet um, so I think Wandering Earth would have some similar similarities to some of my some of my short fiction that's published in science fiction world. Mm, uh, do you agree with your books can become the movie and the I would love that. If, if, uh, <laughs> I'm always hoping, right? It's, uh, uh, so far it hasn't happened, but uh, you know if that if that did happen, I'd be I'd be super excited. Um, I, I think they'd be great movies. I, wait, I'm waiting for you know a, a movie studio to call me any minute. I'm, I'm, <laughs> if they call, I'm saying yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, but, but, uh, when I was uh, talking with my friends, there are a lot of arguments about the difference between uh, science fiction movie, uh, sorry, fi science fiction no novel and um, fantasy story. So I would like to know what's your opinion about it. That's a good question. Uh, there, yeah, there's definitely a lot of debate about um, science. You know, what is science fiction? What is fantasy? I've read there. There are certain science-based novels where I've heard it argued that they're not really science fiction at all because there's no speculative element to them. Meaning, there's not something in them that couldn't happen. Now there's not some speculative, invented new, new technology that doesn't really exist in real life. So it's not technically science fiction. It is just literature that has science sort of within it. Um, I've heard that described. I've also, um, and, I, and I'm not sure I disagree with that. Um, I've also heard, um, you know, there there's uh, there's stories like uh, Dragon Riders of Pern, which are set in outer space and are other planets that seem to have technology, but then there's dragons in it too. So is that fantasy or is that science fiction? So I think it's definitely the spectrum and it's a blurry line. I guess in, in order to answer that question differently than I've heard other writers answer, I will say I think that the mindset or attitude of the writer and the way they structure their stories might be important. Because I wrote a story called um, Stone Man, and was, I meant it as a fantasy, and it is a fantasy, and it was categorized as a fantasy, but when I got done with it, I realized it was actually structured like a science fiction story, Bec and in a way, it was just a science fiction story uh, that used fantasy as a metaphor for what I really was talking about, uh, but, and when I say that, I mean, so it, it's a fantasy story, but I set very concrete rules for how certain fantasy elements would behave in this particular universe, and then I extrapolated out from there 
and I took them to their extreme, and I used that extrapolation as the arc through which to tell the story. And I realized that's exactly how I write science fiction. So I had just written a science fiction story with sort of fantasy clothes. So, although nobody else noticed that, but no one ever said, hey, this is really a story about you know, this other thing. But, so, Thank you. Once again, I, I'm not sure if that's a good answer, but. <laughs> Science fiction is a combination of science and uh, literature. Uh, how to coordinate the proportion of the two? So how do you coordinate the combination of science and the literature? Yeah, that, that, that is one of the central challenges. Uh, you, can, you can definitely get it wrong. There's a... Uh, you know, there's a book out now called uh, Seven Eves by Neil Stevenson. And Neil Stevenson, he's a great hard science fiction writer. And, you know, I think, I think he proves it sort of comes down to taste in terms of how you balance the things. Because he definitely balances it way more in favor of the more science than, than I would think I could get away with. Like if I had, um, you know, he could kind of go on and on and on about the sort of scientific aspects of the story. And he's such a great writer that people don't notice that they've spent, you know, 10 pages reading about some, you know, really intricate detail of, you know, aerospace technology, um, you know, without getting too bored. Whereas someone else maybe, you know, by the time you're two paragraphs in, they think, you know, a reader would say, gosh, why are we on this? You know, get back to the story, get back to the story. And so it is, it is sort of hard to balance those. And how to balance them is probably dependent on the exact writer, and and if you can get away with what you're trying to do, you know, it, it all depends on the project, I think. Thank you. Any other questions out there? Staring. Oh. Reach it for the mic. <laughs> hey, can I do a quick introduction yeah. about your work, published by our publisher? Okay, um, so my first novel in English called The Games, and in Chinese, I believe, called The Gene Competition, that's published. Um, here in China. Also, my third novel, The Flickerman, which is a quantum mechanics thriller, uh, also published here. And then in addition to that, basically, I think almost every single short story I've ever written, or most of them, have also been published uh, through science fiction world. And so I've, I've written um, or published more than probably 20 short stories. Um, and they, they cover a, a wide range of different uh, different subjects. Some of them are set in space. Some of them are, you know, they're they're set in, in the real world. Some of them are set sort of in fantasy world. So it's a it's a it's a wide range of different things that I, I've published on. So it's hard to kind of uh, pigeonhole. I've I've been accused of being too scattered. You know, I've been told I should like, hey, just focus on one kind of story. You know, you'll be more successful instead of you know going here and going there. And you know, it's hard to it's hard to pin my stuff down because I, I branch off so much in so many different areas. You know, it's like people thought people who read my first book thought, oh okay, this guy's a this guy's gonna be writing genetics thrillers or books about genetics and then I then I went to quantum mechanics and like what does quantum mechanics have to do with genetics? The only thing it has to do with it is I'm fascinated by both. I'm fascinated by genetics and quantum mechanics. And I think there's a lot of uh, sort of dark matter in both of them in terms of we don't really know where they're going to go in the future. And so those are the things I'm interested in, where I don't know the answer to something. And so I kind of, if I don't know the answer, it makes me interested, and then I try to invent the answer, and then I can kind of come up with what I think is the most exciting answer. So if, any, if my story doesn't leave any comments, probably that. Can you uh, just do a short introduction about the book Genetic Competitor? Oh, sure. So. 
the, the, the premise is in the future, genetic engineering will become a competition. And so different countries will compete, compete against each other, much like the Olympics, where they will create these scientific creations who will then battle to the death in an arena for supremacy. And then if you are the one, you know, if your country is the one that wins, then a lot of accolades go to you. And then so the, you know, the competition happens over and over and over again. And so all these genetic engineers are trying to create these things, um, which, will, which will win out in, the, in this grand arena. So the problem is when um, in one program, they decide that the genetic engineer who had previously had a lot of success and had won these competitions, he was starting to get older and they thought that he uh, they thought that he wasn't going to be able to pull it off again, and so a new AI supercomputer had been used, uh, had been invented, and they decided to let the AI supercomputer genetically engineer the next gladiator rather than the scientist. So they told the scientist he could still work on the project, that he could still help develop the creature, but he wasn't allowed to write the code for the creature. The code for the creature was going to be written by this AI. Well, it turns out, Anytime you give an AI that much power, nothing good's gonna happen. <laughs> and so uh, the AI had its own plans for what it wanted this particular gladiator to do, and it didn't match what the scientists wanted this to do. And so it turned out that uh, when the creature was born, it was nothing like anybody expected. And the AI was not gonna answer any questions about why the creature looked the way it did, why it had the abilities it did, what its ultimate goals were gonna be. And this particular genetics program, they were out of time, so they just had to run with it. They just had to, they had no other options but to let this thing compete. And then I, don't, I won't give away the rest of the plot, but that's the, that's the gen general premise of the book. So how did the, this idea come out of your mind? Do you have any secret skills to raise your inspiration despite of Baiju? <laughs> <laughs> Say, yeah, so that, that joke comes come from uh, he and I had a little chance to buy you the other the other night. Um, it was a good time though. Uh, I you know it's hard it's hard to say it's hard to say. Um, I've always been re really creative. I've always had this sort of like running engine in my head, the constant idea generation. It's always it's usually caused me nothing but trouble. You know when I was younger, that's why I was in it, when I was in middle school. I had more detentions than any other student in the whole school. Like the principal told me that. He said, you were the worst kid in the whole school. And uh, so somehow, it, somehow ending up here as a writer it, it was not very expected. I think I, you know, it, had I not been a writer, I don't know, my life would have, I don't know, hard to say what it would, how it would have turned out. But um, I, don't, I don't know that I have any particular trick or, or funny skill other than just not giving up. You know, just not being able to give up. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's that, uh, that sort of tenacity, you know, that you, the reason I have to keep writing, even when I want to stop, is because I never feel as good as when I finish a story. And writing makes me feel good. And writing controls my thinking. And so that was the reason why I had to keep writing, even though I gave up. So maybe that's my skill, is that, nothing makes me feel as good as writing, so I have to write. And when you're sort of stuck with that, well, you better hope it works out for you, because <laughs> otherwise you're spending a lot of time doing something that's going to be a waste of time. So. Thank you. So what came out positive that you think maybe that would be helpful to let you get the inspiration of writing? It, it is important to have a lot of a lot of hobbies. Um, I've been accused by my wife of, of having way too many hobbies, and I do. I, like I have a freakishly large number of really weird hobbies, but they all end up in my books and they all end up in my stories. So I look at them as research. But other people would say that I have too many hobbies. Like one of one of my hobbies, I, I and this is very very unusual. So don't think that oh yeah everybody everybody in the USA does this. No, only me a couple other people, but I breed mice. I actually have little colonies of mice <coughs> that I've been breeding for, for particular characteristics, 
And I've been breeding the same colony of mice now for years, it's probably eight, eight or nine years, breeding for specific color patterns. And it's a bizarre, I don't even tell people about the hobby because they just think it's so weird. But, um, but it's very calming to me. And so I have, you know, like a row of aquariums where my mice are, and then I sort of select which ones are gonna be crossed with which ones. And then I had a very particular goal in mind. Uh, I wanted to go for a particular color pattern. So I picked certain mice to breed with other mice and very, very slowly over generation after generation after generation, now 15, 20 generations, I finally have produced what I was aiming for. And then, so then you switch to something else. So you keep that colony, colony going, but then you think, well, I've achieved this goal. I want to do something harder now. So you start breeding for something else. And so yeah, that, that's a weird hobby, mouse breeding. Um, let's see, oh, I also, I, I collect skulls. I like, um, I like uh, anthropological, museum quality replica skulls, like Homo erectus, Neanderthals, Homo floresiensis. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by anthropology and archeology span and sort of like where we came from as a species, you know, the bones they dig from the ground. I've, I've been fascinated by that since we were a kid. So it sort of like is answering the question of who are we really, you know? And so I collect those. Um, I, I bike ride a lot, that's another hobby because it sort of lets me daydream whenever I'm on my bicycle, uh, riding on a bike trail by my house, you know, I come up with ideas and then I take my, I used to have a paper I'd have with me, but now I have my phone. So I stop my bike, uh, frantically type type an idea into my phone, and I'll get back on my bike and keep riding, and I'll stop again, frantically type. So that's another hobby. Um, uh, then also, uh, I, you know, I have a house, uh, so I like, uh, I like building things for, building things for the house, like a deck. Uh, I'm really good with wood. I like, I like building things with wood. I'm terrified of any plumbing. <laughs> I'm terrified of, of electricity and uh, light switch. So I can't do any of that, but I need something built out of wood. That's a relaxing day for me. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna get my hammer, get my saw, get my nail, I, I can build stuff. So that's another hobby. Um, and then of course reading, and then of course video games, and then of course watching movies, and yeah, so. And drawing, that's the other thing I, I draw. I do a lot of uh, uh, art. I showed, I showed uh, yeah. you some of the stuff I, I draw. Not many pictures. Yeah, you know, pictures. <laughs> Although we, it's weird, I can only draw sort of, uh, I can only draw humans. And, like, and, and, skull, and archaeological skulls, I can draw those too. But like, if I had to draw a car, it would look like a first grader drew it. Like I just wouldn't be able to. So it's, I can only draw things I'm sort of obsessed with. And I'm only obsessed with a small number of things. So I don't know, kind of very use of, use of the talent. Thank you. Another friend. Another friend. <laughs> 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 uh, he, he knows that you. He knows that you create the you, you write the story of Dota 2, and uh, you you want to know you want to know things because uh, from the beginning Dota, Dota is just a a work of the community. Right. Yes. Yes. And uh, when you write when, when you write the stories, um, are you affected by some of the of the former maybe the Dojo the Dojo worker the, and the the works by the those. Uh, those unofficial un works? Uh, no, yeah, the, parts, the parts I was working on was a lot of the dialogue. And so we, you know, the, the goal was to sort of like take things in a new direction. And so, yeah, I, I did not uh, incorporate any of the dialogue from uh, previous incarnations of those same characters. So, uh, yeah, probably not. Out there. Um, 